Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have a great guest returning. Welcome, Michael. How are you? Pretty good. Glad to be here. I am happy to have you back. Today, we are talking about something something that happens on almost every farm, something that I think can cause resentments, something that's misunderstood and hopefully rewarded at some point. Can you guys guess what we are talking about? Sweat equity. So I'm really excited about this, Michael. You know, as I mentioned, it happens on every farm and not many people are discussing it and talking about what it is and how to compensate for it. So we have an exciting episode here for our audience today. Before we dive in, can you tell our audience a little bit more about you and what you do? And then we'll roll. Yeah, I'm Michael Langemeyer, Extension Agriculture Econo- Economist at Purdue University, uh, dealing primarily with farm management topics and agriculture finance. And of course, that fits in uh, quite nicely with transition planning topics such as sweat equity. Okay, perfect. So why don't we start at the top and define what is sweat equity? This term is used frequently in, in farms and all family-owned businesses to reflect, to reflect the fact that uh, the person coming back to the business, uh, in this case we're primarily talking about farms and ranches, uh, may not be paid uh, the same salary they could get elsewhere. And so it's a term that's used to, to, to talk about the fact that, well, you're working for this business and someday it's going to be yours. That's usually how this is phrased uh, when we're talking about sweat equity. And so you're going to have to put in some time and, and get a below average salary, but, but someday all of this uh, farm or ranch is going to be yours and, and therefore you're going to have uh, all this equity. We hope. Oh, sorry, did we I hope. say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shoot. Oh, that's Tracy sometimes. Okay, so let's roll into, I think this is a great place to start. Let's talk about farm profitability, accepting a returning family member, and the connection to sweat equity. I know you have some really good thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, the, the real question here is why does sweat equity occur? Why, does, why do we continually see this uh, when a lot of people coming back to the farm today, you know, they, they, they have some pretty good opportunities out there. And so, and quite, and, 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 so, and quite often the farms are going back to is profitable. And so we continually see a uh, sweat equity. Well, well, there's really two reasons. You know, as I indicated, some people going back to the farm have quite a few opportunities to work for agribusinesses or, or, or uh, for example. And so, and so their, their salary that they may receive at, at another place could be quite high. Uh, and, and, and so the, uh, the, the people that are currently on the farm say, well, we can't afford to pay you the $75,000 salary, but we can pay you $35,000. Uh, uh, and, and so, and so you're, you're not paid uh, as much as you'd be worth in, in, in the alternative job. And, and, and that's a form of sweat equity because uh, essentially that's, that's a, you're, you're missing out on a huge opportunity there by coming back to the farm and making $35,000 rather than $75,000. But that's not the only reason why this topic is so important. What often happens uh, on farms is when a person comes back, uh, the, the business really gets re-energized particularly if you're talking about a person coming back uh, to a farm that only has dad or only has dad and grandpa, uh, the, the business in, in some sense gets re-energized. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's, not, it's a chance for that business to really grow uh, and gain equity. Uh, and, and, and through that process, uh, the equity on that farm increases dramatically compared to what it would have if that person wouldn't have come back. And that's not quite often, uh, quite as often discussed as the fact that the person's not going to be compensated as much as they get an off-farm job, but they're both extremely important. You take the rather extreme case, uh, let's say a, a son or daughter is coming back to a farm that would would would, uh, would have to sell machinery or sell land or, or would probably uh, sell out uh, if that person did not come back. 
Well, it's probably obvious in that case is not only a, is a person perhaps giving up salary, uh, they're also they're also creating a situation where that business is going to grow and 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 gain equity. And, and both of those concepts are extremely important uh, to think about uh, when a person is coming back to the farm. It's also important for uh, for the non-family, you know, the non-heirs, or, or and I shouldn't say non-heirs. Uh, the the heirs that are not coming back to the farm to understand that this is going on, uh, that that the son or one son or daughter is coming back and, and receiving a salary that's quite a bit lower than what they could have received elsewhere, working for an agribusiness example, and the fact that this person is really uh, allowing this farm to grow uh, and gain equity, uh, and, and therefore that's 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 very important to the farm, uh, and to the farm's profitability, but also the, the final equity that there might be there uh, when, when dad or grandpa or both uh, want to retire. Yeah, you know, I think that's important, and I think this is naturally progressing this conversation as farm values, farmland values get higher and higher. And we're trying to figure out that fair and equal in estate planning, right? And if you're not on a farm, it's hard to know what goes on. It's hard to have a context, just like anything you're not involved in, right? You look and then sometimes you may look in and you go, well, that's not fair. Why is so-and-so getting this and the rest of us are getting this? And they don't realize that maybe they worked for half the wage as the other farm non-farming family members did, right? Or no yeah. wage or whatever the situation is. Plus, because of their labor, just like what the non-farming siblings did to their career, the farm child took all their time, attention, energy, put it into the farm and grew that business as their career, right? So I think this conversation is important for the farm children, for the farm founders, and for the non-farming family members as well, for them to hear that and go, oh, that makes sense. I had a career of 40 years being an electrician. I started my own business oh, that's what my farming sister did. Okay, that makes sense, right? Yeah, and another thing that gets complicated here is they say, well, if you know, sometimes a farm doesn't seem very profitable uh, and, and, and you have to answer the question. We want to separate this from the issue of sweat equity. Is the farm big enough or going to be profitable enough after the, after, you know, after the person comes back uh, for 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 the for the person coming back to be a full time farmer, so that's another question that we're not really addressing when we talk about sweat equity. We're typically assuming that the farm is it's it's feasible for the person to come back, and so those questions ha have all uh, has have already been answered. But I want to go back to something I said earlier. You know, it, I see a lot of situations where a son or daughter is coming back to the farm, and and just in the next five to ten years, when that person comes back, the farm doubles in size. Uh, and so it's really important, you know, to understand it's not just the salary that the person's giving up. It's the fact that that farm was so much more successful because that person came back to the farm and, and as I indicated, re-energized re the farm. I, I just see this over and over and over. And, and, and we need to compensate that person that's coming back for the fact that the business was very successful or more successful than it would have been otherwise uh, because they uh, because they came back to the business and so and really communicating with the with the off farm uh, with the off farm heirs is it's it's it's, it's, the, it's the salary that that, that this person uh, is giving up but it's also the fact that this business was so much more successful uh, because the person came came back to the business now one of the things that's also that uh, gets really complicated but it's important for everybody everybody to understand even if a farm was extremely profitable, uh, there's there's always a lot of use for those profits. One of the use of the profits, obviously, would to pay each of the people, each of the uh, individuals in the business, more money. But if you if you uh, if you distribute a lot of the profits to the individuals, the farm does not have enough money to grow. Uh, mm. to Land and put down payments on land uh, to buy machinery, and so and so. There's always this. There's always this issue about what what should we do with profit. And so, even if a farm is very profitable, it might make more sense in some situations uh, to pay that person that's coming back less than what they would receive elsewhere, so that we can grow, we can expand faster. We have this opportunity. 
160 acres that's only a few miles away uh, and, and if we pay uh, if, you know we pay a lot of money uh, to the people in the business we won't have enough money for the down payment to buy that land and so and so this can get pretty complicated and that's why I always say that it's it's both of those reasons that are really important it, you know is, is is how much lower is the salary that is very important but also um, what did we do with money uh, you know, if the farmers profit, well, uh, do we use that money to, to, to grow the business and make this a more successful business? And both of those are extremely important when we're thinking about sweat equity. So true. I didn't even think about that, Michael. Here on our farm, I mean, we've been going for a number of years. It feels, still feels like we're just getting going. And I guess if you're aggressive, you're always building. And you are so right. If we were a two-party family operation, and we, we take most of the profits and put it back into the farm to grow, to buy more land, down payment. We're growing. And, you know, I wonder when that will stop. So if you think of that, if we worked from one farm unit with Anthony's parents and we were putting all our profits back in the farm and then at the end the farm's worth this, and then they divvy it up to all the other children, that's not fair. Because if you think of it, the non-working children, let's say they went out and built a business or had a career, they pay all their bills, whatever is left at the end, they pocket in the bank or they go buy a second property, whatever the case is. So I didn't even think of that factor that often we're reinvesting. And when does that actually end? And now if that farm gets divvied up in an estate plan, where are we accounting for the fact that we never took the profits we deserved? Whew. Yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty complicated. And think of a situation. Here's another situation where the farm's not necessarily growing, but in order for the farm not to shrink, because sometimes if someone doesn't come back, you know, as as the as 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 dad and grandpa, I've used keep using dad and grandpa as an example here. They're going to get older, and they're going to say, "We can't farm this much anymore." And yeah. so the business shrinks. Well, what does that to do do with equity? Whereas someone comes back, uh, the business doesn't have to shrink, uh, and and so the and so the and so the business stays the same size, and therefore the, therefore there's quite a bit of equity, uh, you know, there for of farm heirs uh, when dad, dad or grandpa are deceased or want to completely uh, quit farming. Hmm. That is so smart, Michael. I am so glad you're on the show. <laughs> okay, so did you have any thoughts on that or do you want to roll into how do we measure sweat equity for estate planning and the dilemmas that come up? Yeah, one of the ways to measure sweat equity, and there's a two different metrics. It's very important to very important to keep track of. Is first of all, what did we pay the person that's coming back to the farm? And this is both in salary and benefits. Sometimes the benefits for the returning uh, person coming back to the farm are are a lot bigger than we think they are. If you gave that person a house or a rent free or or, or very low rent, uh, if you bought new pickups, maybe you maybe you paid for part of a car. For that person, maybe you gave them a, a side of beef or, 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 or a hog, yeah. something like that. So add up all the, the salary benefits and then try to compare that. Uh, and again, we use rough figures here. Try to compare that with the, with the, what the salary or benefits would have been uh, if they would have taken another job. Uh, sometimes the gap there is, is, is relatively small. Sometimes it's relatively big. So that's important, pretty important to keep track of that. The other thing to keep track of is to think about, uh, okay, this person's gonna come back uh, to the farm. Let's say the person came back uh, 10 years ago, came back in 2010, um, you know, uh, and, and let's say in 2030, uh, for example, uh, we think you know, uh, uh, that's kind of the, for planning purposes, uh, that's, that's when the, some of the, some of the uh, assets are gonna be divided. Uh, among the heirs. So just for planning purposes, we don't know what, exactly what that day is going to be, but let's say, it, let's say it's 2030. Uh, we need to ask this question, you know, what, how much ground or how much equity did dad have at the time that the person came back to the farm, 2010? And, and, and that portion of the equity, it, it, it seems to me to be, be, be fair, if you will, to divide that amongst all the heirs, including the, the farm heir. But but the, the trickier part was is is how much would the how much did the equity grow because that person came back in 2010? Well, at least a portion of that equity 
uh, really needs to go to the on-farm air because again, the business was more successful, the business grew because that person come back. And so, and, and so in addition to the salary that they received, uh, and making up for the fact that the salary is relatively low, we need to think about that change and part of that change in equity that occurred from 2010 uh, to 2030, for example, really, really needs to be attributed to the on-farm air. Uh, you know, certainly a portion of it is his dad's was was dad, dad had the equity in 2010, and 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 uh, dad and grandpa had the equity in 2010, and and that that equity may have grown because of appreciation for land uh, here in the United States. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you have a long period of time land uh, land appreciation has been about five six percent since 1960, so it's very real, it's very sizable, and so that would have occurred if person wouldn't have, if, if if the on farm air wouldn't have come back, but. But, but some of that growth in equity was, was attributed to the on-farm air. And so a portion of that needs to go to the on-farm air and a portion needs to go to the off-farm airs. And, and I know these calculations can be uh, rather tricky, but the important thing is, is to think about the concept uh, that we're, we're trying to make up for the fact the person received a relatively low salary because they back, uh, came back to the farm and the fact that equity is much bigger uh, 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 bigger in 2030, for example, because that person came back to the farm, and so the important thing is 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 to think about those those two concepts. Uh, and and I, I would like to talk, I would lead that leads me into talking a little bit about uh, the dilemmas because they're related to that. Uh, and you always get this question, um, you know, how do we treat each uh, 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 child fairly? Uh, well, I'm I'm an off farm heir, so I'll, I'll I'll use that perspective. It would have not been fair. My, both my parents are deceased. It would have not been fair uh, for my brother uh, to come back to come back to the farm. And when my when my, my mother my mother uh, died uh, after my father, uh, when my when my mother died, just to divide all of the assets among all three of us. Only the only person that came back to the farm was my brother. That that doesn't seem fair at all uh, to my brother. And so because it doesn't reflect the fact that he had a relatively low salary. Uh, during the year he farmed uh, with my parents, but also the fact that that the business was, is bigger uh, because he's there. I mean, he was very, very instrumental in, in keeping that business going when my father had some health issues. Uh, and, and so the business was much more successful because because he came back. And so and so when you're thinking about fair, that doesn't necessarily mean equal. Uh, it, it, means, uh, it means factoring in the sweat equity. Uh, and so that's one of the dilemmas that we're trying to, we're trying to, um, address uh, with our discussion of sweat equity. We also want to address the fact that uh, these increasing land values, uh, you know, uh, uh, let, let's say that, let's say, uh, and this was actually the case in, in my family's case, but it's a case in a lot of situations where uh, when the on-farm air comes back uh, over the next several years, maybe they bought some ground together. So there's a lot more assets there uh, because, the, because the person came back. If the person wanted to come back, Dad or Grandpa may not have bought that land because they didn't really need it. Uh, they, they really couldn't handle what they, they could only handle what they had, uh, and so they, they decided not to purchase that. And so that gets into that increase in farm equity and how does that play uh, in, into our decisions uh, regarding sweat equity and, and fair versus equal. Hmm, that makes sense. That's really good factors and dilemmas that do come up, right? And how to handle yes. them and how to be rational and fair, but fair is not always equal, right? Yeah. Kate, I have a question for you. You wrote a fantastic article for Purdue University. Would you be okay if we share that for our audience? Yeah, of course. It, it talks about some of these points about the, uh, receiving a salary that's lower than what the uh, what, an, what an agribusiness opportunity uh, uh, would have been and also this it goes through an example, quantitative example of this increase in equity. And so by, yes, by all means. Okay, perfect. And that's where I was going with asking you if you're okay that we share that. And we'll put that in the show notes. What I like about that, it has everything we're talking about here today, but it has an example, a numbered example and some math, which is not always easy to do on a show like this. So if you guys are watching, listening, go to Farm Marketer, the show page, and we will include that as an attachment. Download that and have a look at that. That's very valuable. So that is perfect. So calculating sweat equity. 
Is there anything else you want to add there before we go to other factors? Yeah, so there's a couple of things related to equity that I do want to talk about. In, in the United States, and I'm assuming this is similar in Canada, it's, it's certainly true in, in most parts of the world that have private land markets, uh, which is most of the world, uh, you know, land makes up over 80% of the typical balance sheet. And so, and so land is, the, is really the asset, the main asset we're talking about here. It's probably not obvious to everybody that's listening uh, listening to, uh, to what we're talking about here, that we're primarily talking about land, you know, how we're, how we're going to kind of, uh, uh, you know, do the fair versus equal with regard to the land holdings. Uh, it, it, it makes a lot more sense to me that the machinery, green bins, things like that, they're part of the operating entity. And so, and so by definition, those assets aren't necessarily split. Uh, with, with the with the off farm heirs, we're primarily looking at how to handle land uh, because that's the that's the main asset that a lot of people worry about uh, with regard to off farm heirs. The other assets are part of the like I said, part of the operating entity, and those assets need to stay in the business in order to in order to order to continue the business. and uh, And so I did want to make that point uh, that we were primarily talking about land, not talking about machinery, not talking about grain bins and uh, you know we, we do a lot of transition meetings we always kid who wants to own a fifth of a tractor well that's a very uh, you know that uh, the need to think through that uh, that, that the, the asset the primary assets we're going to uh, leave the off farm heirs is, is is land and, and perhaps cash uh, to make up for the fact that there might be a lot of machinery or, or building uh, buildings in the operating entity and so and so I, d- I did want to make that point okay fantastic. Okay. Now there is some other factors that are involved in sweat equity that are that are very very important, and 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 in my family situation was like this, but many families uh, have a similar situation. Quite often, when somebody comes back to the farm, uh, they're they, they're also they're also uh, doing some things that the other family members cannot do. Uh, what in the world is he talking about now? Specifically, taking care of mom and dad as they get health as they have health problems. As they, as they, uh, taking care of finances when they get, uh, when they, when they get a little fuzzy uh, thinking in terms of those kinds of things, they really don't understand what's going on anymore. And so, quite often, the off farm heir uh, spends a lot of time uh, taking mom and dad to the doctor, uh, making sure that uh, that uh, uh, you know keeping track of of their finance. And, and, and so and so they're not losing track of, 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 of what's going on and so that's worth something and so if, if that's the case if, if the on-farm heir is the only person that's in the in the vicinity of where mom and dad live that's also worth something and in some cases that that can be worth quite a bit because sometimes a parent even moves in uh, with the with the on-farm heir and and uh, and and that inc- that increases the um, that in, that increases, uh, you know, perhaps the uh, you know, perhaps the life of of, of the of, of the older generation, but also a lot of the, a lot of times the older generation, most of the time, the older generation would la- rather live uh, with a family member than have to go into a assisted living or a nursing home, and that's worth a lot of money to that older generation to be able to do that. And uh, you know, I've had uh, uh, you know seen situations back in Nebraska where I'm from. Uh, well, that that that's what happened is is the on for on farm air took care of the parents so they didn't have to go into assisted living as early or even even prevented that altogether and so that's another another thing that needs to be factored in here that's a good point and i can relate and i know so many people out there and I think we've talked about this in different episodes. That's a big fear with the founders in transition planning, getting kicked off the farm, losing the farm. They love that, right? And I, I haven't been farming for that long, but I get it. You put so much into the farm for so many years. I don't even have kids, but I said, I'm going to die on this farm. Somebody's yeah. going to have to come check up on me, whether it's kids or not, but I want to die on this farm. So I completely die on this farm at a very old age let's practice yeah. that <laughs> it's mo it's mowing grass it's 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 making sure that the snow is removed i mean the list goes the list is rather long when you stop to think about that and yeah just to keep that i just want to make sure everybody keeps that in mind that that's also a you know very very important to that older generation and 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 and, and sometimes needs to be factored in okay. now I, I want to talk a little bit about one of the problems with sweat equity 
Uh, we, we, we've been talking fairly positive with regard to handling sweat equity, but there is a downside with sweat equity. And, and so we, do, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the downside of sweat equity. Perfect. Uh, this occurs when a farm is, is not particularly profitable uh, when the person comes back to the farm. And so this saying that all of this is going to be yours someday really doesn't amount to much. Uh, mm-hmm. Never has enough cash flow. Never, never has enough retained earnings. We, we've talked about retained earnings before. Never has enough retained earnings to, to, to really to, to expand or to even, even uh, budge that equity very much. And so, and so a, a person can spend a lot of time working in that business, uh, decades, in fact, and there's not much sweat equity when it's all said and done. That's why I did that preface earlier that, it, uh, that we, we really need to think about that feasibility uh, before we talk about sweat equity with a, re, with, with a returning heir. And, and so make sure a person, make sure everybody goes through that feasibility. Is this farm big enough uh, for the on-farm air to come back, and and a lot of times it's not. And 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 think about a plan of, of what's going, what has to occur, uh, you know, for that business to become more profitable and support everybody that's that's on the farm. And so and so just because we're we're where we are, we are realizing that we have some sweat equity and we've got a plan to deal with it. Uh, doesn't mean that necessarily that plan is going to work out perfectly. Uh, and, and so we need to think about this feasibility uh, of coming back to the farm along with the discussion uh, of sweat equity because uh, it, it's really sad to see a situation. And uh, this was probably more more common in the past than it is in the, in the present. But I, I still see it where someone comes back to the farm. Uh, the farm was not very profitable. And, and when it's all said and done, they, they really didn't get much uh, for their efforts. And, and if, 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 you know, some people that's, you know, money's not everything. And so that, that is a big deal, but we all need to have our eyes open uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, so there's not some, some sour feelings 30 years from now and say, man, I thought I was really getting something here. And I, I spent all this time and, and there really isn't, isn't anything, uh, you know, left from an equity standpoint. And so, uh, and so we want our, all our eyes to be open uh, and so that's why that feasibility test is so important before we even discuss uh, sweat equity. You know, I really like that, Michael. That's something as I've been getting older, something I wish people spoke about more often just in um, career counseling or whatever it may be. You don't, you don't really realize until you get a number of years in as you get a little bit older. I'm not that old, but I'm not that young. <laughs> Every year, if you stop and you think, at some point you realize time's precious. And then you go, I'm investing my critical career years in this. And that kind of hit me and I love where I'm at. But I had that moment going, okay, I'm investing my prime years in this. Am I okay with that? And exactly like you just said, okay, I'm coming back to this farm it might not have a lot of equity. There might not be much left at the end. I'm making a good wage, but you know, I'm okay with that, right? Kind of that, what is it, a wake-up call? <laughs> yeah, it, it's transparency is, is what I would call it. Just making sure that everybody understands what they're getting involved in uh, at, at the beginning uh, is rather than rather than too late because we, we don't want somebody to, to regret that. And it's, it's, it's kind of like when you, well, it, it, well, it's a lot like when you talk to about uh, you know how, what they're going to do when they enter the job force is is any job is critical. At first, you know, picking that first job and, and getting a job that you know has the has has the salary and benefits, but also a job that you like is critical uh, to the success. It's just like that uh, when that person's coming back to the farm, if not more important, because yeah. you're a business leader. Whereas whereas with the Pick the first worst job. Well, you can get out of that relatively easy, though not as easy as you might think. But when you're, if you're the business leader, that's not so easy to get out of, uh, and it might be pretty costly to everybody involved uh, if you do have to to get out of that. I kind of that falls along my mission in life. Take control of your own life, right? Don't let life happen to you. Have a plan. I've known people that have farmed that. Eh, you know, they would have loved to go do this. And sure enough, they get to an age and then they go, I'm too old. I'm stuck here. What a way to live yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Right. But yeah, 
Anyway, yeah. sorry, I took us. <laughs> it also, it also, I don't want to go and get into you get too much of a tangent here, but it's also related to to thinking about re- retirement income, not only for the for the person that's coming back to the farm, but also for the off farm heirs, and also for the for the older generation that's already on the farm. Is is that's part of the conversation? It, you know, is is what is going to be my source of retirement? And if, if this person comes back to the farm, is that going to look better, worse? Uh, you know, how is that? So that's all part of that feasibility test uh, in terms of retirement. Uh, one of the reasons why I talk about land separately, uh, uh, um, this is very, 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 this is usually very important. Is typically the older generation uses land rent, uh, renting to the person that came back to the farm specifically, or people that went back to the farm. We can talk about cases where there's several people, came, you know, several of the younger generation came back to the farm. I deal with several farms where it might be four or five uh, younger farmers that have came back. And, 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 so, and so that younger generation rents the ground from that older generation. Well, that, that could be the major source of, of revenue for that older generation when they retire. Uh, I've seen that over and over and over, and so that all needs to be thought through uh, when when someone's coming back to the farm, uh, and and it's 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 related to this sweat equity, but it but it's related to this larger issue is 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 you know how do we make this decision about regarding uh, whether someone uh, uh, can uh, or is thinking about coming back to the farm? Okay. I'm going to ask this and it's going to be kind of tongue in cheek because I know it's not as easy to do this in many farm families, but I'd imagine that when you return to the farm, this would be a great discussion where you're actually having an intentional discussion. Hey, mom and dad, I can go sell for so-and-so company and make $80,000 a year. You're paying me 35. Let's go with your example. So my understanding here is the rest of this is sweat equity. And hopefully at the end, when you're doing estate planning, I will be compensated accordingly. So that would obviously be a great way to proceed, right? <laughs> Instead of just yeah. assuming. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, you got some, some families, you got to be a little careful there, but just make sure yeah. that, 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 you know, for transparency purposes, that you, you understand what's involved here. You understand that you're not necessarily going to, uh, the salary you could have made uh, made uh, working for an agribusiness, and 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 that might, that's probably okay, or you wouldn't be thinking about uh, coming back to the farm. But just just make sure everybody understands. Well, I do have some expectations here that uh, I'm going to receive a larger portion of the farm, um, you know, uh, at the end uh, because I did that. And so and so and and so just see what the reaction uh, is to that. And in some families that. Uh, they'll be nodding of heads. And yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what we had in mind. Uh, I've dealt with some families where that wouldn't go over real well. Uh, and, and when they say uh, fair versus equal, they mean equal. Okay. Uh, I do run across those situations, and that's that's a situation where the, the person coming back to the farm, you know, they really need to do some do some head scratching. You know, is am I okay with that? Um, you know, and, and and making sure that uh, in that case, they need to make sure that they're their compensation from the farm is not extremely low. Uh, that there is enough compensation there, uh, so that, you know, so that they they can build up some personal equity themselves, uh, and they do have enough, uh, you know, enough income there that if they want to invest in in, in land, for example, uh, they will be able to able to do that. And so, uh, but but the, but that that's something that definitely the older generation, the younger generation, uh, needs to have a heart to heart. Uh, and uh, thank goodness, and in, in, in my family, that 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 occurred, and, and in many families that I run across, that conversation takes place, but it doesn't always take place. And sometimes, you, sometimes the younger generation, you know, farmers tend to be rather uh, uh, shy people. There's yeah. a lot. Of I'm an, I'm an introvert myself, and so there's a lot of introverts in 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 the production agriculture uh, community, and so these things aren't necessarily necessarily thought of unless you start asking questions and. This is not the time to just uh, you know, say, well, I don't want to upset, or I don't want to ruffle any feathers, feathers. I don't want to upset anybody. You need to know what you're getting into. Uh, and the answers may, sh- may surprise you uh, if your family is very quiet about these things. You know, in some families, when, when a person's growing up, they try to explain, uh, explain how this works, and others, they don't say a peep. Uh, and, 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 and so transparency is very important for all parties, uh, including the off-farm heirs. 
Uh, the, the fact that this conversation took place is important to communicate uh, with the off-farm heirs so they, they know what's going on. Uh, they know, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what mom and dads uh, are thinking about, uh, you know, down the road in, in, in terms of trying to compensate uh, this returning heir for, for the sweat equity. You know, the more and more I talk to advisors and get some great ideas, I realize how tricky this farm, family farm business is. And you hit the nail on the head with the introvert. I know a lot of families that don't communicate. And it's hard. You Talking to you guys and having these great ideas and wanting to be clear and in control of your life, you don't want to tell people in the audience to barge right in there, right out of university, make all these demands. But on the other hand, what is the balance of assuming and working 20 years to be found to find out that X and then you wasted, wasted, maybe not, maybe like you said, you were okay working on the farm because that's your dream and that's enough and good, good, good. But it's a tricky balance. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. And it, another, you know, when, I, when I talk to people that are thinking about going back to the farm, you know, I, I teach a finance class, and I usually try to talk to, uh, to you know, give an opportunity for those people to discuss uh, transition issues with me. And so I talk to quite a few of those stu students when they're going back to the farm. I always have them talk about talk about sweat equity, talk about compensation, talk about uh, talk about these issues. But another issue to talk about that gets really sensitive is control. Mm. Uh, is you know, <laughs> not saying, well, I think I need to have management responsibilities from day one, but be thinking about, you know, at what point it, it does my does the older generation going to give me more responsibility? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes this increase in equity is is driven by by joint control. Uh, and, and what hap what's a classic what classic what happens here and this is human nature I understand this with families I understand exactly where both parties are coming from someone comes back to the farm or some ones uh, there's several several at once want to come back or over a period of 10 years I want to come back they want to grow the business they, they understand that uh, you know if I'm going to be successful I, I need to make sure I have economies of scale and, uh, and make sure the business is, is a certain size to make sure everybody uh, makes a living uh, from the farm. They, they understand that. And so they might be relatively aggressive with regard to expanding. You think that always goes over well with the older generation? No, because no. the older generation may be in a situation where they spent their entire life paying down debt. The last thing they wanna do is, is to borrow some more money uh, to buy some land uh, that's next to them. Because I spent all this time paying down debt and now you want me uh, because you came back to the farm, you want me to go in debt again, or, or uh, a rather large way go in, in debt again. And so the, this issue of control, uh, you know, need to be discussed. Again, uh, you don't want to push too hard there, uh, being the, uh, from the younger generation standpoint, but you need to gauge that a little bit. You know, how are you going to come, how are you going to come to a, a conclusion in, in that particular case? How are decisions like that going to be made? This all ties in with uh, uh, with this, with the sweat equity discussion because uh, you need to know that if, if if the worst thing that could happen and I've seen this uh, you know too often too where someone comes back to the farm and they they, ex they essentially have no management responsibilities for a decade or more well that's just not going to work uh, you know uh, given what businesses need to do uh, in terms of investing in technologies investing in land that's just not going to work anymore uh, you know they, they, there needs to be some joint uh, you know, joint uh, management responsibilities fairly early in the process uh, so that that younger generation has a chance, uh, you know, to, to make, a, make some decisions uh, uh, and, and make mistakes uh, mm -hmm. because we're going to make the right decision. Uh, we, we know that when, we, when we're investing in something, we always make the right decision. I've made quite a few wrong ones in my career, um, and, 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 but, but yeah, they're given a chance. Uh, you know, to make decisions, given a chance uh, to to uh, to allow that business uh, uh, to increase uh, equity and, and to grow. I love that comment. We grew our operation actually from nine cows to the next 25 and that way. And, you know, it is so clever having done it that way. That's just how it worked out for us because you make mistakes on a small scale and decisions on a small scale. And then you go to the next level and the next, if we were handed an operation of our size at that age, oh my gosh, 
that could yes. be you can make some massive financial mistakes <laughs> in just how um inexperienced and energetic you are and also cash flow there's some tricky stuff so yes. I hear you. That uh, that's one of the dance too with the farm family business is the control, and then having individuals in different stages of their yeah. career. Naturally, yeah. when you're older, you're a little more risk adverse. Usually, not always, yeah. but you want to be scaling down, and the young guns are coming up, right? <laughs> and, and this is difficult. We we all know because sometimes things just fall in, in a family's lap, like all of a sudden. Neighbor, a neighbor was farming 500 acres and, and they just want to quit. Okay. And you have the opportunity to either rent, rent, perhaps maybe even buy some of it, uh, those 500 acres or not. Well, that's a, you know, for, for a lot of families, if it's just a couple of family members involved, that's a lot, that's a, that's a lot to take on. Uh, uh, you know, and sometimes it's, it's 2,000 acres. And so, and so sometimes those, those happen and you have to make it a tough decision. But, but a lot of times that's not the case. Uh, it's baby steps, uh, you know, expanding slowly but surely, uh, you know, picking up an 80 acre, something like that, and seeing how that works, and then picking up an 80 acres after that, you know, seeing how that works. And so, uh, and, and so just beginning that process of, you know, how a decision's made in terms of renting additional ground, uh, you know, buying, uh, buying land, um, you know, talking to off-farm heirs uh, with regard to, for them buying land, for you to farm, uh, and, and so on. Okay. So I have a bit of a maybe weird question, a little bit more corporate, a little more hourly mindset here. And I wonder if there's merit or not. I'll ask the question. We're talking about sweat equity. And then at the end, when the founding generation are going to be divvying it up, hopefully it's clear communication. Hopefully that farm family member is compensated accordingly. Should they be keeping an hourly log. I think that's overkill. Can they, how, how should somebody handle that? Well, one of the things they're going to need to do, and I, I don't think it's necessarily an hourly log, but they are going to have to keep track of, of the relative contributions uh, to labor, uh, you know, for, for everybody involved in the business. This is, this is important if there is some people part-time, but it's also important you know, as the older generation starts to slow down, uh, that needs to be that needs to be considered because uh, this goes into a topic that's not not directly related to what we're talking about here, but it does come up uh, in in in, uh, in farm families is is dividing business income. Mm. If the younger generation is providing uh, you know, much of the labor, uh, maybe even quite a bit of the management, uh, uh, and and the older generation is not providing very much labor and or management anymore. Uh, that's important when we're thinking about dividing business income. We're not only we don't we not only divide business income based on the assets that are owned in the business. We also uh, divide the business income based on the time spent in the business. And so, keeping an hourly log is probably not necessary, but I, I do think it's important uh, to keep that in mind. Uh, you know that that there is there is certain family members that are contributing quite a bit more than every other family members, and so you don't pay them the same. Um, I, I think most people would think this through, but but I see situations where maybe one one of the younger generations f farming full time, and maybe two others are farming part time. Uh, it didn't be recognized right away. Is is what is the relative contributions? in terms of time spent in the business. Yes, those part-time employees are extremely important during the planting season, for example, and they need to be compensated for the fact that they're, they're involved in the business, but their compensation is not going to be even close uh, to as high as, as, as what the, uh, uh, the full-time operator is going to be. And so, and so uh, you know, somehow, uh, somehow uh, uh, you know, keeping track of that at least a little bit. Yeah. Sounds like common sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know how that goes. <laughs> I know that common sense ain't so common. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, but it's but it's important. It, it really is very important for those people that are that are that are that are a part time in the business to be compensated. Uh, that's that's one thing I, I do see sometimes is you know you just expect someone to help you out during the peak times and and maybe they're compensated a little bit, but they're not compensated very much. That all needs to be in this kind regarding sweat equity they need to have they need to have 
uh, you know, send some re resources sent their way, or, or more, maybe a little bit more of the inheritance sent their way, because they were critical. We couldn't have farmed as many acres or as many head as we had if we, we didn't have their assistance during peak hours. Maybe we maybe we couldn't have taken a vacation if those people weren't around. And so and and so just like the the on farm air uh, that that's farming full time, uh, it, try to compensate those people helping you part time. That makes sense. And a lot of those big farm operations like grain operate that way, right? The kids come back for harvest and yeah harvest wouldn't get done if it wasn't for everybody pitching in. Yeah, and certainly as timely as, as it gets done. And, and, you know, timeliness, of course, is very important uh, to the productivity. And so, uh, and, and so that, that, yeah, we need to keep track of those contributions. Excellent. That is a lot of good stuff. And I'm finally, I'm so excited to finally be having this conversation on the show. It's long overdue. And, you know, I don't hear that many people talking about it. So I'm so thankful that you have joined us to share your wisdom on this. I'm going to work to wrap up the episode. Do you have any final thoughts, words of wisdom that you want to share with the audience on sweat equity? Uh, not that I can think of right offhand. I think we've covered the main points, uh, but I emphasize the importance of not only thinking about the sweat equity, uh, thinking long and hard about how income is divided, because we, we did talk a little bit about that too, uh, how it's divided on the farm and, and what's what's the logical uh, way to divide, divide income. That's another conversation itself, but both of those are very important topics that the on-farm air needs to be thinking about uh, when they come back to the farm uh, and as they stay on the farm, you know, because this is going to change over time. Uh, you know, maybe the sweat equity as the farm gets bigger, maybe the sweat equity will be less of a concern because maybe the farm is making more money and they can pay the person more. Uh, and the same with dividing business income. When the person first comes back, uh, they may not get a large share of the income because they don't have any part of any assets. But as they start buying assets along with the older generation, that all changes. And so don't think of the sweat equity dividing business income as a static concept. This may change. Uh, this may change over time, and so and so. Once you've kind of developed a plan on how you're going to address uh, sweat equity and, and, and dividing business income, uh, you know, change that plan over time as 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 things change. That is a great note. And then the final word is, and and, and please, please uh, be transparent, so that everybody knows. Uh, everybody knows, uh, including the on-farm air. You know. Uh, how we think this is going to work, things change, but how we think this is going to work, but also to make sure that the off-farm heirs understand that you had this conversation with the on-farm heir. Excellent. That was amazing. As always, it was a pleasure having you on the show, Michael. I enjoy learning from you. You bring such powerful information to our show and our audience. Thank you. And I appreciate the fact that you are okay with us sharing that article. And if you don't mind, I'd love to share the second article on splitting business income as well, because we mentioned it a few times and it's very relevant here. So we'll include- Yeah, definitely that. share that. And it, again, it has some examples uh, in it that will help people think through this. The Perfect. We'll include those in the show notes then. So thank you, Michael. I really appreciate your time. And thank you guys in the audience for joining this episode. I have really enjoyed it. If you did as well, please like it, share it, get it out there so other farmers can hear Michael's great wisdom. Thanks guys. Bye. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.